Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for Grit, Grace, and Resilience, the story of successful caregiving. I'm Calvin Hu, Education Coordinator at FCA and your host. For four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through consultations, classes, workshops, publications, retreats, research, and advocacy. If you'd like to learn more about us or access our online tool, FCA Care Journey, please visit us at caregiver.org. Uh, now for some quick housekeeping. Uh, during the webinar, your phones or mics are going to be muted. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can ask them by using the chat style question box on your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Now, uh, if you have to leave a little bit early or uh, knew someone who wasn't able to attend today, uh, we do archive all our webinars and they can be viewed later on our website, again, caregiver.org. Uh, finally, we're going to be asking you to give some feedback after the webinar ends. We use this to help shape future education programs, so I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling those out. Um, we do read all your comments and uh, very much appreciate them. So today I'd like to welcome Sarah Delaney. Um, Sarah earned a Master's of Science degree in Gerontological Nursing at um, University of California, San Francisco, and is, a certified, uh, is certified as a Geriatric Clinical Nurse Specialist by the American Nurses Credentialing Center. Uh, for the past 14 years, Sarah has worked with adults with um, cognitive impairment uh, in community, long-term care, and hospital settings. Before joining the Care Ecosystem Study Team um, at the Memory and Aging Center, uh, in 2014, Sarah worked as a stroke nurse, stroke nurse at Kaiser Hospital in San Francisco and a dementia clinical nurse specialist and rural dementia care coordinator for the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System. Um, the focus of Sarah's work is on improving care delivery and support for patients uh, with dementia um, and, of course, their caregivers in whatever setting they may live. Um, as a little bit of an aside, um, I'm very happy to have Sarah with us this afternoon as she um, gave a fantastic talk for a retreat we had the pleasure of hosting in Richmond uh, not too long ago to over the summer. So uh, we're very happy to have Sarah back with us today. And um, now that you know a little bit more about our guest, I'd like to turn things over to Sarah. Thank you, Calvin. I'm really happy to be here, and as you can see, um, the title of the talk is Grit, Grace, and Resilience, the Story of Success for Successful Caregiving, um, and I'll just say that the content of the talk um, is uh, derived from um, my experience and things that I've learned from caregivers that I've worked with over the years, as well as um, things I've learned from um, colleagues in reading. So. Um, go ahead, next slide. Our objectives today are to describe three reasons why acceptance is important, to identify three tools to help balance safety and independence, and to identify three healthy coping strategies for caregiving. So we're going to start by asking the question, what is acceptance? What am I talking about? Um, and from the dictionary, acceptance um, is to recognize something as true. So in the context of um, caregiving for someone with dementia, it's um, I, I think a big step is recognizing that the person has um, dementia and accepting um, that diagnosis can, can be a major challenge. Um, and then another part of acceptance as a caregiver is actually agreeing to undertake the responsibility of caregiving for someone. Um, and then it kind of enduring that um, situation and um, kind of taking it on willingly. Next slide. So um, this is a quote that I keep with me at my desk and um, Victor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor who wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and I keep it as a reminder that um, when any time something happens um, that, that you know might be frustrating for me or um, difficult that that I have um, some a choice in the situation. So 
Between stimulus and response, there is a space, and in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So with any situation that we're faced with, and in the context of caregiving for someone with dementia, um, I have a picture of many doors, um, because there are many doors that, uh, or many situations that you're going to be faced with. Um, over the course of caring for someone with a disease um, and you're going to have to um, choose how to respond and hopefully um, choose to respond in a way that um, is, uh, you know, promotes your growth um, and, and well-being as well as the person that you're caring for. Um, next slide. So what makes it challenging for us to um, you know, make decisions that are in everyone's best interest um, is sort of this evolutionary function of our bodies. Um, so this is a um, picture of the autonomic nervous system and it's showing the fight or flight response um, on the right hand side with the sympathetic nerves. Um, and the sort of rest and digest, sort of our resting state. Um, this is, uh, evolutionarily, this is sort of how we've survived, right? We're um, confronted with a threat. Um, I, I've really had in my mind the um, people in Houston these days and imagining what um, they're experiencing. So, you know, for our survival, you know, our bodies release adrenaline, um, you know, our, we, um, our blood goes to certain organs and is taken, um, you know, diverted from other areas to allow us to escape and survive, um, which is really useful. Um, the problem is that um, this response can, is also triggered by things that aren't necessarily life-threatening. Um, so, you know, we've all been startled or um, heard a noise that might be scary and you hear, feel your heart beat faster and maybe a, you know, feeling in your gut that um, the feeling of being afraid. Um, and, you know, you might tell yourself, oh, that was the wind and um, help yourself sort of take a deep breath and calm down. Um, or, you know, you might use your imagination and imagine the worst case scenario and get, you know, your HPA access involved and cortisol levels and your blood sugar goes up and your um, blood pressure goes up and, and it might not actually be anything. So you've sort of, you know, put your body in, um, in this high stress um, mode when that's not necessary. Um, and we can also do that in interpersonal reactions. So, you know, somebody says something and you get defensive and it's not life-threatening, but you get really angry about it. And, um, you know, it maybe instead of letting it go, you actually ruminate about it and just keep thinking about it over and over again and just keep yourself in this sort of high stress um, state. And that, that's where we really see um, negative health outcomes with hypertension and, um, you know, lower life expectancy, honestly, it reduces your immune function and um, makes you more at risk for diabetes. So, um, so you know, this is a great, um, you know, system that our bodies have. And I think we also, um, it's important for us to learn how to um, make it useful for us and, and not harmful to us. So next slide. Um, so um, when our fight or flight response is activated, um, and it is activated by um, and the brain. So um, these are the kinds of functions that um, are also activated. So. Um, you know, are, that are involved in the fight or flight response. So we have the ability to feel what's going on inside of our bodies. Um, you know, that gut feeling that something's not okay or pain and you need to, you know, take your hand off of a burning um, pot. Um, we also have spatial orientation or navigation. So if you're being chased by a predator, you can figure out how to escape. Um, and if, um, 
more predators come or, or the path you're, um, you're running on has you know, an obstruction or a barrier, you have the cognitive flexibility to, to figure out how to go a different way. Um, there's also motivation and planning, so that's definitely something I'm sure people in Houston are using right now to strategize um, how to deal with their situation. Judgment and, and decision making, so noticing when something is um, dangerous and when something might be an opportunity. Um, and then relational skills, we are, um, you know, tribal people. We um, have evolved um, and developed civilizations and um, that, that's sort of how we continue as a species. So the ability to collaborate and coordinate with others um, is part of how our brains help us survive, you know, reading people's emotions and figuring out how to work together. Um, so this is all in the normal context and part of the reason why I have this slide up is also to say that um, when someone has dementia, um, they still have the, the fight or flight response, um, but they have less of the abilities that are shown here. So they, they have less ability to, um, you know, have the energy and the focus to plan or initiate actions if, if something is wrong. Um, you know, if they have energy, they might not be able to focus it or um, plan how to use their energy and it might just, you know, come out as like just a stre distressing behavior or pacing. Um, they may lack the ability to judge when something is dangerous um, and, you know, there are all kinds of examples of that. You know, maybe um, they hear a noise and are not able to distinguish a noise that is dangerous from a noise that is non-threatening and they might just leave the house and actually put themselves more at danger. Um, they lack cognitive flexibility, so really reliant on routine and structure and have um, much harder time typically adjusting when, um, when there is a change, even just a change in the person who's, who's with them that day. Um, and often their relational skills are affected and um, that is, can be really um, sometimes enhanced in someone with Alzheimer's who may be um, you know, more empathic but um, you know, very impaired in someone with frontotemporal dementia, for example. So from the caregiving perspective, um, accepting the situation that you're faced with um, gives you, you know, three um, benefits. It allows you to sort of take a step back and actually observe the situation, um, notice what's going on, and adapt when that's what's needed. It's sort of like when you hear a noise that's scary and you sort of realize that, go check it out, and realize that it's not um, an actual threat, then you can kind of think about it. Um, and calm down. It allows proactive planning and goal-directed action, which is really important um, when working with someone um, or caring for someone with dementia. And it also allows you um, to kind of let go of things. So if we spend our time, it, it's sort of, um, you know, the 12-step motto of um, letting go of things that you have no control over. Um, but then you can actually focus on the things that you do have control over and the things that you can do. Um, so letting go of maybe who the person was before, um, the future that you thought you might have together, um, and working towards what is possible. Next slide. So when you get to the point of acceptance and you're um, able to observe kind of what's going on, there are some things that are really helpful um, to look out for. And one of them are sudden changes. So with people with dementia, we um, typically see a gradual decline in their um, function, cognition, and behavior. And um, if you ever notice a sudden change, um, that's really something that you should bring to the attention of a doctor right away. Um, 
people, like I was mentioning, the interception or the ability to um, know what's going on inside of you. And, and if, you know, we're constipated or hungry, we can either go get food for ourselves or, you know, tell someone we're hungry or, um, you know, we can do something to meet that need. But um, people with dementia may not have that ability. And the first sign that they're dehydrated, for instance, might be that they're really confused or they can't walk as well or, um, you know, they're just really sluggish. And it's the kind of change that would happen over a matter of days um, to hours versus um, over months. So um, that's what I mean in terms of a sudden change. Um, and it can be a sign that, you know, urinary tract infections are very common. Um, pneumonia or a cold can really cause a lot of confusion. Simple things like, you know, dehydration or constipation. Um, something I forgot to put on here, but it's also really important are medication side effects. So, um, you know, talking to the doctor about if, you know, they've just started a medication and then had a sudden change, you know, more falls or less coordination, kind of difficulty walking, those are things to talk to the doctor about um, because they're reversible and, you know, the person will still have dementia, but, um, you know, they'll maybe get back some of the function um, that they lost and will hopefully not end up in the hospital. Next slide. Um, and, uh, you know, if you've gotten to the point of getting a diagnosis of dementia, then you're already probably pretty good at observing the person um, because that's what brought you to uh, ask for an evaluation. Um, but if, you know, you're thinking that maybe somebody has dementia, uh, these are the kinds of things to look out for. Um, driving accidents or close calls. Financial mistakes, definitely um, forgetting to pay bills or paying bills twice. Um, you know, making purchases that just don't make sense or, you know, um, making poor financial decisions. Um, that can be an early sign of cognitive impairment. Falls, people um, with dementia are much more at risk for falls for various reasons. Um, and that is a major cause for hospitalization in people who have dementia. So it's an important one to look out for. Um, wandering and getting lost, this can be, you know, you go to the store with them and you know, you turn, you get distracted and the next thing you know, you can't find them or they go to the bathroom when you're in a restaurant and don't come back um, to, you know, being at home and not recognizing home as home and trying to leave. Um, so wandering, you know, people, if they get lost, um, that's definitely dangerous. They can, um, you know, all kinds of things that can happen there. Um, household accidents or close calls, so paying attention if um, someone's cooking on their own and burning food or eating spoiled, you know, you look in their fridge and it's full of spoiled food or um, trying to eat non-food items or, you know, using lotion instead of toothpaste, those kinds of things. Weight loss is very common, just forgetting to eat, um, forgetting to drink, and swallowing problems are typically um, later in later stages of the disease, but um, can um, happen in the early stages as well. So choking or coughing when you're trying to swallow liquids, um, those are um, that can lead to pneumonia, and it's important to talk to the doctor about that. Next slide. Um, so a common challenge in caring for someone with dementia is trying to balance. Um, their safety, you know, protect them from harm and also respect um, their independence, so preserve their dignity of who they were and um, especially people who have awareness um, and insight, you know, it's going to be harder to um, get them to agree to limits on the things that, that, that they can do. So helpful tools are adapting the environment. Um, to support them to do things as independently and safely as possible. Um, being careful about the way you communicate with them. Um, I think people with dementia, um, you know, are often talked down to um, by healthcare providers, staff, and even family members. So really, you know, being conscientious about how you talk to someone and um, creating a routine. So as we looked before, um, 
at the ways our brain help us survive and, and the way that people with dementia lose those functions, you know, they don't have the ability to initiate activities or structure their own day. They really rely on other people um, to do that. So even if they were not people who kept a routine in the past, um, they w will likely benefit from having a structured routine um, in the context of living with dementia. Next slide. So helpful environmental strategies. Number one is reducing clutter. Um, uh, often people with dementia will have visual spatial um, perception challenges and having a lot of things on the counter, on the floor, um, will make it difficult for them to navigate and figure out what to do. Um, whereas if you know just the items that they need are visible, um, they'll be much more um, successful in being able to use them effectively. So it, when I say improve lighting, um, you know, and just look around your home and, and kind of take a look. There are certain lights that really cast shadows, um, and that can, if there's you know a high contrast shadow on the floor, for instance, or on the wall, that can be misperceived as somebody or someone being there. Um, it can also be perceived as a hole on the floor um, and glare as well. So, you know, if a window or mirror is reflecting a light, um, you know, that can contribute to misperceptions that, you know, they might have hallucinations around that, think that they're seeing something that's not there. Some people are um, really disturbed by seeing their own reflection. Um, and in that case, you might need to keep any kind of reflective surface um, covered, you know, mirrors, windows, um, things like that, but that's not across the board. Um, adaptive equipment is helpful for anyone who has mobility issues, and I just gave some examples there. Um, removing and secure or securing rugs, um, again, uh, you know, people with dif some kinds of dementia will have a, a shuffling step and you don't want them to um, trip on a rug. Rugs can also um, contribute to the visual spatial. So if you have a like a black rug on a light colored floor, it might appear to be a hole. They might not be able to process um, that it's continuous floor. So color contrast is useful for like, you know, having a grab bar and being able to see it um, you know, you don't want a white grab bar and a white wall. Someone's not going to be able to see it. Um, you know, their utensils that they use, their plate, you know, have a contrast with the food. So often people use a blue or a red plate to make the food more visible. Um, but, you know, you don't want things to be too busy because if you have really busy wallpaper and busy floor pattern, then they're not going to, it's not going to be helpful. So being smart about using color contrast in the environment. A <clears throat> um, couple other helpful strategies. Most people um, that I've come across have sort of a their favorite place that they tend to hang out um, in the home, and it's useful to keep things like um, water and a snack and you know items that help them feel secure. So for me, that would be a cell phone. <laughs> I'm sure for a lot of people. Um, and you know and an activity so uh, caregivers are always asking you know how can i get them to do something and sometimes it's just having it available vis visible um you know crosswords in the early stage a simple puzzle maybe just some balls of yarn they can um tw twirl or, or roll um let's see, books, magazines they can look at, iPad apps people can use. So just, you know, something to divert their attention if they're sitting there listening to the radio or watching television or just looking out the window that they can have something to keep their hands busy with um, at some point. And then, you know, setting up workstations. So um, I have some visual examples of this, but, um, you know, observing what, how the person that operates in their space, in their home, and kind of enhancing um, whatever system they have in place. So if they keep their toothbrush in a certain place and you know make sure that the toothpaste is near there and the toothbrush and not the lotion or um, any other kind of product that might be confusing, 
to the person. Um, we can go to the next slide and look at some pictures. So here's an example of a living space that's pretty cluttered. And I have the um, source here, thiscaringhome.org, which is a website I highly recommend. Um, they have great resources. It's sort of an old-fashioned website, but very useful content. Um, so as you can see, there's a rug there. There's some shoes, papers, stacks of books on the floor. Um, you know, the coffee table has a bunch of stuff on it. There's a cane there, electrical cords. Um, so that's going to be a tricky place, uh, space for someone with dementia to navigate safely. Next slide. And here's the same space, but um, they've just sort of cleaned it up a little bit. So you see they have a basket on the coffee table. Um, and, you know, you can also have a basket next to the chair. Um, but, you know, putting things, instead of just sort of spreading it out, um, putting it in a basket or a storage container, um, they got rid of the rug. And the cords are kind of tucked back. It looks, you don't see the cords. Um, so much simpler appearing environment and uh, the floor is clear. That's especially important to keep the pathways clear. Um, so this is a dining room table and um, just an example of how visually disturbing it could be for someone with visual spatial problems. Um, I'm not sure that someone with dementia sitting at the table would recognize anything on that table as food because there's so many things on the table. So um, really having a space um, that's clear um, and not so busy so that they can, you know, both recognize that it's mealtime. You want a visual cue that it's mealtime and then they, they, they can see their food. Um, so here's an example of setting the plate. Um, in this example, they're using a white plate, but a colored placemat it has the same, you know, color contrast effect. Um, colored cup, and yeah, one more example. Uh, another common, you know, issue is the counter in the bathroom. So I think a lot of bathroom counters tend to look like this. We um, have a lot of products that we use and um, it, it even in the early stages um, you know even when people can read they can just you know accidentally use hair gel instead of toothpaste or lotion um, you know alcohol instead of mouthwash so keeping anything and especially cleaning products or toxic um, products out of view and just setting up the things that they're going to use for a task. So you can see the next picture, like so. And in this case, they wrote toothpaste on um, the tube, and you might write hand soap on um, the hand soap. And you know that that will work for some people, and um, might just not work at all for others. But um, it is another strategy. So um, I was excited to kind of learn about proper chairs. And again, this is from that same This Caring Home website. But um, you know, mobility and helping people get in and out of chairs is, is something that um, becomes an issue for most people with dementia. And in order to preserve our backs as caregivers, it's helpful to use equipment that um, helps people to be as independent as possible. So um, if you look at your chairs at home, you want to see that the armrests go all the way to the edge of the seat and that they have armrests that people can push off of. You'll notice all of these chairs have a space underneath where they, you, because when you stand up, you actually bring your ankles back a little bit underneath you so that you can push yourself forward, get your center of gravity over your feet. Um, reclining chairs typically don't have this space and a lot of people like reclining chairs. So if you do have a reclining chair, you might think about getting one of the electric ones that has a button that will push you up out of the chair. Um, so it can be a trickier to get out of. Um, you want a comfortable but firm cushion. If, if it's really too cushy and low to the ground, um, someone's going to have a a difficult time getting up. 
Um, and you can also consider the kind of a full stree. And if you have um, water absorbent of full stree, you can consider getting a little pad to put um, on the chair for someone with any incontinence issues. Next slide. And I've included um, some of the resources um, for the environment that I've found really helpful on this um, slide, and I, we can make the slides available um, if you would like to. Um, I recommend all of these great resources. Next slide. So our um, second tool for preserving um, dignity and independence is um, adjusting the way that we communicate with people with dementia. Um, I think one of the most important things is just recognizing people with dementia often have a slowed processing time. So I tend to talk fast, um, and that's something that I have to keep in mind is just, you know, talking at a um, slower pace, giving the person time to respond, um, and taking the time to listen. So um, if anything, I would um, use those two as the number one um, recommendations. The other um, thing is just to acknowledge when someone has memory loss, it's just you know one of those situations that you're going to have to accept. It's because of the disease. Um, there's not really a medication that um, reverses that, so if they are asking the same question over and over, um, uh, you know, the best thing you can do is just sort of try to not get frustrated, <laughs> have a matter-of-fact tone of voice, um, you know, don't tell them you just asked that, why are you asking that again, uh, make fun of them or argue with them. Uh, just give them the information. And this is something that, you know, setting up a predictable routine, using some um, calendar or uh, some way for them to kind of check that on their own um, can be helpful. But um, also just kind of trying to tolerate it and maybe just have a script in your mind that you can just repeat the same thing over and over again. Um, and it, so just remembering that people aren't doing this um, they aren't saying or doing things to frustrate you or to get on your nerves typically. They are actually doing the best that they can and don't have the ability to, you know, calm themselves down by telling, reminding themselves of something. They actually have lost the memory. Um, so it's, you know, we have to use the brains that we have to help support them with their impaired brain. Um, and, you know, again, they have this fight or flight response. So they, they feel uh, afraid, they feel sad, they still have feelings and it's important to acknowledge them um, and offer reassurance, um, you know. And I, so I'm talking about this in t context of dementia, but I've actually, <laughs> and I, because I talk about this a lot with um, caregivers, I've sort of observed in myself, like I, I went to London over the summer and had really bad jet lag and was just like, hadn't slept and was not functioning very well. And I kind of observed um, how um, my boyfriend was responding to me and, and I wish that he would have done these things. <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're sort of things that actually work for all of us. Like we want people to reassure us. We want people to tell us it's gonna be okay. We want someone to give us a hug when we don't feel well. Um, and, uh, you know, so, and if not everybody actually responds well to affection, so keep that in mind, um, that can be a trigger for some people. So if that's the case, they might respond better to, you know, a stuffed animal or a pet or, an, um, a real animal, um, that can be reassuring or sometimes calming music to, or nature. Next slide. Um, so having a sense of humor, I'm, I did say don't mock the person, and um, I would say, but you know, laughing together is definitely um, useful, and um, there are usually a lot of opportunities to laugh together in the context of dementia. 
Um, and you want to avoid elder speaker baby talk. So um, there's actually been quite a bit of research in the long-term care setting where, um, you know, staff talk down to people or, um, you know, use a high sing-songy tone of voice and speak to people like their children. Um, I mean, a lot of these strategies, you know, distracting and redirecting them are strategies that you might use with a long ch young child who hasn't learned to regulate their own behavior. But um, you are speaking to an adult, so you, you're going to, you know, use a different tone of voice um, and, you know, not call them um, dear or, um, you know, those kinds of terms of affection that um, might be misperceived. And, and that's culturally, I mean... I think f for a lot of people um, in the United States anyway, that, that might be offensive, but um, in some cultures that might be less offensive. So um, being sensitive to that. And when someone is really distressed, you know, basically they're in that fight or flight response and need help de-escalating, um, really so important to try to stay calm yourself. Um, I would say just, you know, take a deep breath, really focus on a long, slow breathing out, um, acknowledging their feelings and um, trying to redirect the conversation. So this is something that takes practice. It's sort of, it's like, you know, you go to the um, improvisational theater and people come up with these scenarios. Um, so y you might not be very good, <laughs> it might be kind of hard to figure out how to redirect someone when they're so focused on, um, you know, this isn't my home, I need to go. Um, so one thing that, that, that's helped me with that um, is to just kind of look around and see something in the environment that I can use as a cue. So s sometimes it's, you know, oh, I love your necklace, you know, where did you get it? That's so sparkly. Um, or, you know, your shirt or oh, it's so hot outside, you know, just talking about something that you can both see and redirect to. Um, another idea is, you know, if they're saying, oh, I have to go to work or I have to go cook for my mom, um, you know, saying, oh, tell me about your mom. She must have been a good cook, you know, c trying to use their topic, but kind of redirect it to a different um, context. And also having something concrete like, um, an activity that you can redirect them to, a snack or music can sometimes help. And if they're really focused on getting out of the house, then you might need to just, you know, follow them, take them for a drive until they kind of forget where they're going. Um, next slide. So helpful phrases um, when you're trying to get someone to do something is, can you help me? Um, will you give it a try? People often ask, you know, how do I get someone to go to a day program or, um, and, you know, giving something to try is not committal. So I, I think it's a little bit of an easier ask to say, you know, can you just give it a try for a week? And, you know, often people will adjust to it. Um, instead of saying, would you like to take a shower? Just say, oh, it's time to get cleaned up. Let's walk, you know, down the hall. Um, giving them a, a really a, a simple choice, like would you like this one or that one? Um, when you're empathizing with their emotions, saying, you know, it, it sounds like you're really frustrated, it seems like you're kind of feeling down today. Um, and always remember to say, I'm sorry. You know, we, we're not always our best self, um, they're not always their best self, and, um, you know, just being re saying sorry and you know we'll get through this together it's, it's a um, doesn't it, it sort of helps resolve conflict um, and offers reassurance um, and I mentioned this before um, that establishing a daily routine is really helpful and day programs are great for this especially for people who have a hard haven't been real um, you know, structured, routine-oriented people from the beginning. It can be challenging to try to set a routine. So recommend day programs to um, give people activities during the day and kind of set t um, schedule. Having consistent sleep and wake times um, is important. Sleep disruption is common. 
Um, if the person, you want to try to keep them active during the day, if they're going to nap, just have a short nap in the kind of early-ish afternoon between 2 and 3. Um, and including exercise, and I would try to get a little bit of exercise twice a day if you can. Um, you know, maybe take a walk in the morning and do some other kind of physical activity um, in the afternoon. But, um, you know, again, because people aren't initiating a lot of these things on their own, um, it can take some effort and energy from a caregiver. So that's, again, another nice thing of why day programs often have exercise as part of what they do during the day. Um, and also, you know, sweeping the floor um, might be a, you know, gross motor activity that could be kind of like an exercise. Um, helping with, you know, loading the dishwasher, folding the clothes, wiping the counters, sorting the mail. It's kind of simpler things. If they're helping with cooking, maybe they can um, help peel things or, um, you know, stir things. Definitely, probably with supervision for most people. Um, simple arts and crafts, you know, coloring books are coming back in style and watercolor painting is a popular one, um, gardening, people can help in the garden, raking leaves, simple puzzles, um, there's, I think it's Springbok has um, like 12 piece puzzles that have like adult um, themes, so you, there aren't, there are options that are um, kind of more adult oriented for the simple, I think there might be 36 piece puzzles actually, but nice big pieces. Um, and simple games like Jenga, blackjack, like a, ma a matching game, um, and the iPads have different apps that can be like ge geographic shape kind of drawing apps or um, storytelling um, podcasts people can listen to. And then, you know, bathing and, and grooming, like, I mean, getting your nails done, getting your hair done. Uh, I think we think of those things more commonly for women, but um, men can also enjoy, you know, um, getting groomed up and kind of, you know, making it an, a nice, you know, um, ritual a couple times a week or one time a week um, can be an activity. So now we're going to move on to um, taking care of you as the, as the caregiver. Um, the, what the person really is relying on you for all of those functions that they're losing um, and you know so you're taking on a lot of responsibility and um, how, how you really need to be tuned into how you're doing and, and taking care of yourself in order to um, really care for the person um, so here are some strategies for that and we'll go into more detail um, for each one of them. Um, when I say tune in to yourself, um, you know, take a moment and like we talk about the fight or flight response and what that feels like, um, just, you know, take a deep breath and see, you know, do you have tightness in your neck? Do you have, um, butterflies in your stomach? What's, what's kind of going on for you? Are you, just really tired um, or you know stressed about money or everything on your to-do list um, there's a book 10,000 joys 10,000 sorrows um, about a couple with um, the wife wrote it about caring for her husband with dementia and she used um, a mantra similar to this every time she would come home from work and before she walked into the door she would kind of take a deep breath and center herself because she never knew what she was going to walk into. Um, so just to sort of try to center yourself before, um, so that you can, you know, be flexible in your thinking and communicate and redirect them if needed or offer that reassurance and really be present. Um, and, you know, this acronym, I think I got it from Marguerite Montarao, who also wrote a book about um, caregiving and dementia. So it's a, it's a good, good, quick and easy way to kind of tune into yourself. And um, just, you know, naming the emotion, you know, you don't need to um, judge yourself for 
being angry or frustrated. That's very human. You're dealing with a really challenging situation. Um, but, you know, just notice it and take a deep breath. Um, try to, um, you know, talk yourself out of the fight or flight and realize that it's not life threatening at the moment and you just need to kind of center yourself a little bit to um, handle the current situation. Next slide. Um, so, you know, because caregiving and dementia is so challenging and you will have, you know, a lot of challenging emotions um, on a regular basis around uh, the changes that are happening and your responsibilities and stresses. Um, that And to have balanced emotions, you kind of have to work a little bit um, to notice the, the positive things. Um, and, you know, one way to sort of amplify the positives um, is to tell other people about it. So, um, you know, it can be a, a little thing like um, caregivers will often tell me um, you know, about that, that one time where they, the, they were shocked to the person they were caring for um, said, thank you. And, um, you know, a little moment of insight or um, empathy for the caregiver and those can be really meaningful. Um, or sometimes, you know, a funny story and another caregiver told me about um, uh, her husband sort of rediscovered his shadow and was just, you know, absolutely delighted by um, his shadow. It's like a child discovering their shadow for the first time, which is really a sort of precious moment. Um, and even though, you know, there are a lot of challenges and she wouldn't want her husband to, to be that way, um, that that's something that's a pleasant moment to share and enjoy and um, share with other people. She actually took a videotape of it and shared it with other people. So trying to, um, you know, remember those pleasant moments. Um, and uh, like I said before, you know, we're a, the tribal species and connecting with other people. Um, so I talked about the fight or flight response and that's, you know, involves adrenaline and cortisol and um, things that in low doses are good for us and, you know, higher doses can have health outcome, poor health outcomes. So one of the um, a newer theory that's um, more research is looking into is the sort of tender befriend theory that, um, you know, by, for instance, people who experience a traumatic event such as a uh, flood in Houston, if they sort of get through it uh, with a family or, um, you know, get refugees who um, escape, you know, war-torn countries together with their family, um, they tend to have less, um, you know, wear on their bodies from the trauma than people who don't have that sort of social support. So I think about that in terms of caregiving, that um, really having other people to sort of um, share and bolster um, you and uh, support you really um, is protective of our health. Um, so, you know, finding either through a support group or, you know, really reaching out to your friends or family or um, professionals, you know, professional therapists um, can be very helpful when you're dealing with this kind of challenge. It's often the hardest thing people deal with ever in their life. Um, and, you know, remembering the things that you're grateful for, um, that's useful also for everybody, and, and especially in the context of caregiving. So I'm currently reading this book, I highly recommend it, by Dr. Vanderkoll called The Body Keeps Score, Brain, Mind, and Body and the Healing of Trauma. Um, and he also talks about, um, you know, sort of um, the fight or flight response and, and that effect on people. So I'm just going to read the quote. Traumatized human beings recover in the context of relationships. The role of those relationships is to provide physical and emotional safety, including safety from feeling shamed, admonished, or judged, and to bolster the courage to tolerate, face, and process the reality of what has happened. Excellent. In 
finally, um, trying something new. So people with dementia, their lives and their world get smaller. And because their world gets smaller, caregivers' worlds also often get smaller. Um, and, you know, I, I try to encourage people to um, really try, try to shake it up a little bit. You know, you're going to have a <laughs> probably a really structured kind of routine, different life than you had before. Um, and, you know, even if it's just, you know, trying to learn how to say hello and goodbye in a new language or trying a new recipe or doing some silly craft, um, but, you know, having some sort of positive um, shared experience um, is can be good for both of you um, and can kind of help you let go of uh, some of the negative thoughts so we can get back down on. Next slide. Um, so finally, I just am going to go through the definitions of um, grit is courage and resolve and strength of character. So I, um, yeah, I'm just so impressed with caregivers that we've worked with. I think in order to accept the role, you really have to have be courageous and strong. Um, and grace or the quality or state of being considerate and thoughtful. Um, a charming or attractive trait or character, and ease and suppleness of movement or bearing. So I sort of think of grace as like, you know, re redirecting people, um, figuring out how to um, keep them safe without uh, making them think you're taking over their life, and um, really, you know, all the effort that people put into um, caregiving itself is it just is so considerate. Um, and then just, you know, the ability to recover from or adjust to misfortune or change. Um, and it's definitely an important um, char characteristic for someone caring for someone with dementia, which can last for, you know, 10 to 20 years. And I just put a link here for um, an article by um, Zen monk Joan Halifax. She has, um, uh, it just talks about um, the acronym GRACE. Um, it's similar to the STOP acronym that we talked about earlier, but you're welcome to look to, into that um, as well. Next slide. And finally, um, I'm just including our website um, for the Memory and Aging Center. It's uh, recently revamped. There's lots of helpful information on there about clinical trials. Um, there's educational materials for caregivers, resources, training opportunities for professionals. Um, also, over the last year, um, our team worked with uh, videographer Keith Moreau, who um, we actually went to people's homes and videotaped um, caregivers for people with dementia. Um, they're fabulous people, so generous with their time and so creative and their strategies and um, we made a series of 10 videos. So they're available um, on YouTube, but this is a link that you can get to them through BitDo Conversations with Caregivers. Um, recommend that and if you have any questions um, for me or about the care ecosystem you're welcome to email me and my email is there um, and thank you okay perfect thanks so much Sarah um, we really appreciate you being with us this afternoon um, I really like that um, fight or flight I've never actually uh, um, heard about um, caregiving or you know um, in that kind of in that context so so uh, pretty cool, um, pretty cool or interesting way uh, of looking at things. Um, we are, um, I think, uh, based on the time, we should get right into questions. Um, so first off, I have a um, caregiver. Um, actually, her sister is the primary caregiver, um, taking care of their mother. Um, I guess the sister is maybe some someone who you know likes to be in control, just historically. But uh, now the mother has Alzheimer's disease, and the um, the primary caregiver, this other sister, is very kind of um, wants to kind of do everything herself. And the person who's asking the question, the other sister, is um, trying to get maybe some advice on how to be able to offer help with um, uh, her sister, who's, who's kind of resistant to either accept or um, receive help for for all this caregiving. Um, 
Oh, well, that's a great question. And first of all, I would just commend that um, sister for wanting to help. I, I talk to a lot of caregivers who um, feel like they, um, uh, you know, people avoid them and aren't offering them help. So uh, commend them for that. I think what's helpful for people in the caregiving situation is just really concrete offers, not to say something broadly or general like, oh, give me a call if you need anything, but to actually say, um, you know, I'd like to come and stay with mom this weekend and maybe you can take the weekend off. Or, you know, how about if I come and um, make dinner or take mom out to lunch or, um, you know, to get a haircut, um, shopping for clothes. Um, or, you know, would it be helpful if I helped with, you know, paperwork and insurance and, you know, billing type issues? So really, you know, thinking about the skills that you have and what you realistically can offer and then really following through on it. I think, um, you know, and it's also great if you can not just offer assistance once, but say, you know, once a month or every other week and give someone um, reliable and consistent breaks um, that would be the great help. Respite's very important. Sure, sure, great. Yeah, that's that's fantastic advice. I think yeah, making maybe having it be offer of you know consistent help, so they know you might not you know necessarily you know leave them you know to 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 um, to jump in at the last moment when they had expected something. You know, offering concrete help, and then of course um, trying to you know. Um, offer your own specialized skills, I think, are, are great ideas in, in maybe helping um, helping uh, offer and get your offer of help um, accepted. Um, I think the other thing also is, um, you know, I think what a lot of people do is they'll say, oh, well, you know, what you really should do is have her, you know, drink coconut water or, you know, eat this, you know, supplement and then they'll get better. And I, I think caregivers often don't find unsolicited advice helpful, um, but it is helpful to listen to them, you know, and say, hey, how's it going for you? I, you know, to thank them for really bearing the brunt of um, the caregiving responsibilities. I think people don't hear that enough. Um, and yeah, just also offering your time to listen to what's going on for them and showing that you care. Let's see, we have a... Okay, another question actually about um, guilt. So um, this one caregiver is just asking um, what's your thoughts on for, um, you know, advice on someone who might, you know, they're kind of doing the best they can, they're providing care, they're, you know, they're, you know, slugging away, they're working at it, but they, they still feel guilty um, that maybe they could be doing more, they could be doing a better job, you know, maybe they could be more present. Um, what, what, would your, what would you tell that, that person? What kind of advice would you give them? Yeah. I'm taking a deep breath for that one because I can feel that. Um, so, you know, I think we all have to sort of take a deep breath and accept the things we can't change. And, um, you know, this is one of the most difficult things that anybody can do, and we can all just do our best. So um, I would say, you know, really try to be gentle with yourself because being gentle with yourself will allow you to be kinder to the person you're caring for um, and that's probably more important than doing everything else perfectly um, and uh, you know if I, I think seeking help when you can you know uh, we all have uh, I said we have the choice we don't always have to say yes you know um, so it's okay to say no and to recognize where our limits are so um, some people for some people it's like they really can't care for someone who's incontinent and and that's okay you don't you know have to They're, just think about okay how am I I can't do this anymore this is too much for me physically or emotionally how can I find the help um, to you know get someone else to take on this responsibility and work with you know the doctor the social worker um, family caregiver alliance to try to figure out how to access um, services and, and do what you can do. Maybe you can't do the physical care, you can't do the incontinence care, but you know you can come and sit with them and hold their hand and be a familiar face and offer reassurance and that's also very important. Sure, yeah, definitely. We, we, we do also see a lot of caregivers, you know, they tend to actually very, you know, as you, I'm sure you've experienced very hardworking, but also um, 
they they do tend to maybe feel a, a little bit guilty and be very hard on themselves. So mm-hmm. it's yeah good to good to let them know um, that it's yeah they can they can be human that mm-hmm. that it's it's okay. Um, let's see. You know, I was wondering maybe if. Um, just briefly, you could let us know a little bit more about the care ecosystem. I know there are um, a lot of professionals who um, join our webinars, but maybe um, kind of uh, what what the goals are, what uh, where um, where it's at in terms of you know um, the research and 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 presumably the um, the reports that are going to be coming, the data that we're going to be able to get out of the uh, the care yeah, ecosystem. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. So um, the Care Ecosystem Study was funded by um, Medicare and Medicaid Healthcare Innovation Award, um, and it was actually funded through August um, 2017, but they gave us an extension through um, February, and we hope to continue um, with additional funding from NIH. Um, we have uh, it's we have two hubs, one at UCSF and one at UNMC in Nebraska. Um, so we have a team at UCSF, and um, so it is a study. We're comparing. Uh, some people are randomized to a control group where they're just doing surveys, and we're getting um, Medicare claims data on the um, people with dementia, and um, and then people in the intervention group um, are supported by a care team navigator. And a care team navigator is someone who is trained um, to, in dementia and um, finding resources and understanding about long-term care and advanced care planning, um, and also some basic medication training. And they're supported by a clinical team. So at each site, we have a pharmacist, um, an advanced practice nurse. At UCSF, we have two nurses and a social worker. Um, and so they um, are the, the navigators are the primary point of contact with the caregiver. It's primarily over the phone. Um, so we serve people at, from UCSF all over the state of California. And um, you know the navigator really tries to get to know the person with dementia and the and the caregiver. They primarily talk to the caregiver. Um, but you know screening for the safety issues, providing education about um, managing behaviors. Um, really reconciling the medications and following up on um, side effects or, you know, our pharmacists can make recommendations about um, stopping medications that might be causing problems and maybe starting medications to help um, with certain behaviors. Um, uh, The social worker helps with some um, advanced care planning and, you know, helping people get to an elder law attorney for Medi-Cal planning for long-term care. Um, So, and it's longitudinal, so um, the idea is that the navigators work with people over time um, because, you know, in dementia, things continue to change over the course of um, the disease. And it's, I think, helpful to um, have someone consistent that um, knows the caregiver and the situation and can make really personalized recommendations. In dementia, you know, we know there aren't really black or white rules. Um, there's a lot of trial and error, and so having consistent people um, is really helpful. Same, similar with doctors, you know, and other providers. So um, there's a couple of publications out now. The the main one, um, just looking at how we developed the intervention, is uh, available in PLOS Medicine. Um, primary author is Kate Posseen. She's our um, project director, PI, and um, more um, you know, publications to come as we get the Medicare claims data and um, learn the impact. We're looking at quality of life for the patient, um, caregiver burden, and caregiver dep- depression, as well as healthcare utilization. So hospitalizations um, and ED use, and um, whether it, uh, we, this intervention helps delay placement in long-term care. So Medicare is obviously interested in cost savings. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, um, you know, um, for it, uh, maybe for for um, for lay people, it might not be as obvious, but the uh, the Memory and Aging Center um, at um, UCSF is is doing some really um, really pretty interesting cutting edge stuff. So um, hopefully, we can you know we'll all be able to benefit from their their research as you know this and other projects kind of. Um, uh, kind of kind of uh, wind through. Um, we're a little bit over, I see, uh, but I would like to get in two final questions, and I think I'm going to try and get two into one. So we have one, um, 
one caregiver whose parents are, um, sorry, whose um, adult parents, uh, I guess, both have dementia, and the uh, sibling is in a little bit of a denial, so they're wondering if there's any way they could maybe um, shake them out of that denial. Uh, maybe shake is wrong, but, you know, kind of get them, you know, get them to move on to the acceptance. Mm. And then the other question is, um, I'm not sure if this is from a caregiver or from a professional, but they're wondering about um, what advice you would give for caregivers who feel maybe, uh, you know, a very human um, resentment of being, you know, caregivers. You know, they, you know, they've kind of maybe planned out their life or, you know, maybe planned out their life with their spouse or, you know, the person who is now receiving care. And, and now that's kind of not what life is, so they've kind of got this resentment. Um, so I guess uh, if you could maybe uh, give some tips on those two kind of not... Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so the first question um, I have two thoughts on. One is um, it can be really helpful in the clinic. I know we have a, a nurse consult clinic where um, the um, patient is evaluated by one nurse and the caregiver meets with another nurse. Um, and it can be really helpful for people who um, are not sort of acknowledging or uh, accepting to kind of, to, for instance, look at an MRI and see the atrophy in the brain or um, look at the neuropsych testing or cognitive results and see how they um, really can't draw a clock um, or, you know, can't remember words or... Um, don't have, uh, can't follow directions in the way that they used to. So it's really sort of an objective um, data that um, really sh demonstrates for people. Because a lot of times what's confusing, I think, is people with dementia will have moments of insight or, you know, they'll, they'll still have their conversational skills and um, that can be really deceptive. Um, so, you know, trying to, um, m maybe it, it having the person accompany them to an appointment where the provider can really show concrete um, evidence of um, the diagnosis. That would be my first advice. Um, and um, the other is just, you know, invite them to spend more time uh, with the person. I think a lot of times it's easy uh, when you're just visiting for an hour or so to not see the full context, but if they were to stay overnight and, you know, really experience living with the person for um, a longer period of time, they'd probably um, see more evidence of the impairment. Um, in terms of the resentment, I think... Um, you know, that's a very natural response. Um, um, two thoughts. One is, you know, that's something you might want to break down with um, a therapist and kind of understand better. I think the thing with caregiving is that it can bring up a lot of things. Um, you know, uh, we have a lifetime, <laughs> and in this moment, you know, our roles are changing, and if you have um, issues from the the past and your relationship with that person that are having an impact on, you know, your um, desire to be with them or, or to care for them if, you know, they hurt you in the past, that, that can really um, be something that you want to process anyway. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, the, in general we say the concept is like, you know, it's better for people to stay at home. And um, But, you know, I think if someone's really feeling resentment and really not feeling like this is something that they can or want to to accept, um, then, you know, work towards figuring out a different option. You know, are there other family members? Is there, you know, can you talk to the doctor or a social worker in your area and find out if there's a way to um, have someone live in a facility or, um, you know, have other people take on a lot of the responsibility? Maybe you can kind of help manage the care but not be as um, responsible for the day-to-day -day care. I, I, I think, you know, saying yes is not always the right answer, I guess, is what I'm saying. And it's okay um, to, um, to acknowledge that this is just not something that is a good fit. Um, and it's probably better for the person and, and better for the person with dementia to, to recognize that. Um, if that's the situation. Okay, thanks. So um, we have uh, one more question. I know we're a little bit over time, but I, I really wanted to ask you this based on your um, your expertise. Um, and sorry if it's um, if it's not a fair question. It's maybe a more philosophical thing. But um, dementia and sexuality, um, in terms of 
um, I don't know, maybe consent or safety. You know, we hear that, I think it was a cong um, not a, maybe a congressman, a, um, a politician whose, I think, wife had dementia, and then he was eventually um, tried for elder abuse because they weren't sure if there was any, if there was consent. Um, and then we have maybe, uh, you know, someone who goes into a facility who's been married for a very long time, who has dementia, and then uh, at that point can't remember um, their spouse and might, you know, want to enter into, you know, a relationship with another um, member uh, at that um, the community, maybe like a, you know, a memory care community. So I was wondering if you had any, any thoughts on that. Well, that is a whole nother ball of wax. <laughs> um, let's see, what are my thoughts on that? Well, um, so I think that um, people with dementia do have um, needs for intimacy um, often. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of different ways that um, sexuality can be affected. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with the particular case that you're um, talking about, um, but, you know, I do know that in general, in, uh, you know, most assisted living and care facilities that um, I believe they're legally protected for having, um, you know, spouses or partners um, have conjugal visits, I think is what they call it. Um, and so I'm not sure exactly how they would um, demonstrate not having capacity to choose that. Um, but, you know, in general, um, having capacity means, um, but is individual for each decision. So it would have to be evaluated in that context. So people with dementia, um, you know, can maybe not make a medical decision um, on their own because they may not um, understand that they have dementia or what the actual risks and benefits of getting a medical treatment might be, but they can probably might ha still have capacity to choose someone that they would trust to make those decisions on their behalf, or they might be able to, um, you know, participate with support and help from a person that they trust. Um, so I guess that's sort of the capacity part of that question. Um, the uh, wanting to um, be intimate with someone else in your sort of living situation, um, I, I think it's a matter of, um, you know, people with dementia can become really stimulus bound, you know, if they lose the context of their memory and their relationship with the person and are in the presence of someone who they might actually interpret as being their, their spouse or, you know, being... Um, someone that they, you know, have an intimate relationship in the past, you know, I think, uh, I think, and I, I, you could argue that they have capacity to do that. They wouldn't probably understand how they're hurting someone, you know, their, their spouse and that their spouse is going to have to, um, cope with, with that. Um, but I think that they, could have capacity to choose to be intimate with someone who's in their um, current environment. And I don't know if that answers your question, but that's sort of my take on it. Okay, no, fantastic. I just wanted to, it's, um, I, um, it's just something I always, always like to ask people um, with the dementia experience, just because it's kind of a, uh, a tricky, it seems like a bit of a tricky... Um, yeah, you know. I actually, uh, when I, I worked in the library as an undergraduate, and um, one of the people I worked with, her mother... Um, who had been married, you know, Lutheran woman, um, developed Alzheimer's and lived in a memory care facility and actually um, developed an intimate relationship with another woman there. Um, and both families kind of just adjusted to it and um, they shared a room and um, they were pretty um, flexible and ad adapted to it. But um, yeah, it does happen. So it's a good question. Okay, well, uh, we've gone a little bit over. Um, I appreciate um, Sarah spending a little bit of extra time with us. I just wanted to uh, try and get through a couple questions. Um, so I'd like to thank you uh, all for participating this afternoon. Um, and, of course, thank you, uh, Sarah, for spending the afternoon with us. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, FCA webinars are a free and continuing series. You can find out more information on our next webinar on our website, caregiver.org. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining us um, this afternoon. Thanks again, Sarah. 
Um, the webinar is now concluded. Um, we hope to see you all for the next one and have a great afternoon.